Hello and welcome to Anglia Late Edition, looking at the big issues affecting us in the east of England. Coming up on tonight's programme. Election time, we're going to the polls to vote for local councils, but what will it tell us about the state of British politics? Back on the campaign trail for another election that was never supposed to happen. And saving the planet by direct action. What impact are the climate protests having and do they work? With us tonight to talk about all that, three of the region's politicians and later we'll be joined by one of those climate protesters who disrupted the capital. So, a lot of talk in recent weeks about a snap general election or a second referendum. But in just a week's time, we will be going to the polls. In most local councils across the Anglia region, prospective councillors are after your vote. But what impact will the state of national politics have on voters and turnout? David Hughes has been looking at the election battleground in the Anglia region. This time next week, they'll be counting the votes in the biggest set of elections since the last general election. 1,500 councillors on 44 councils in the Anglia region. This is the current map of political control. You can see most are dominated by Conservative blue. A few spots of Labour red on the map in the towns and cities. And only one Liberal Democrat majority council in South Cambridgeshire. We need to make a few adjustments to the map for this election. No voting in South Cambridgeshire or Huntingdonshire. They had their elections last year. And it'll be next year for Northamptonshire. The county council is being scrapped there because of its financial financial problems and all the districts are going to. Two new unitary councils created, North Northamptonshire and West Northamptonshire. They've also had a rejig in Suffolk too. Four councils merged to make two new super councils in West Suffolk and over in East Suffolk. They do have elections there and elsewhere. It's a third of the council up for election in some places, but the whole council in others. Now, these elections were last fought in 2015, at the same time as the general election that David Cameron won for the Tories. So back then, the Conservatives won the lion's share of councillors. 1,300 seats, adding in 156 extra councillors. Labour took more than 200 seats, the Liberal Democrats just over 100, but both those parties lost councillors, an especially bad election for the Lib Dems. The EU referendum, well, that was merely a Tory promise back then, and UKIP was still a force to be reckoned with. They added an extra 19 councillors, bringing their total to 52. But this time around, UKIP are fielding candidates in less than 5% of the council seats. And this is how the votes were shared out last time around. Conservatives on 43%, Labour were on 21%. The Lib Dems did win more seats than UKIP, but UKIP were ahead in terms of the popular vote, 13% against 10%. The Greens on 7% and Independents and others on 6 So where are the places to watch this election? Was well, where there are slender overall majorities. For the Tories, it's a tight fight in Peterborough. They took control last year, but hold on with the tiniest of margins. And one or two seats either way in places like Rutland, St Albans and well in Hatfield, well, that could leave them hanging in the balance. The ones marked in grey on our map are the hung councils. That's where no one party has an overall majority, sometimes run by a minority council or as a coalition. The Tories are whisker away from power in Colchester, currently run by an alliance of Labour, Lib Dem and Independents. Milton Keynes, that's also hung, run by a Labour minority. Bedford is also a hung council, but currently with a Liberal Democrat elected mayor, the only elected mayor of a district in this region. That's up for grabs too. So, will voters turn out and cast their ballots? That's the big, big question. Even in good years, less than half the electorate bother to vote in council elections. In some places, turnout can be less than 30%. Will there be a Brexit backlash? There's certainly voter fatigue and general disillusionment with politics. And then, looming over the horizon, an election we were never supposed to have. We could be going to the polls in a month's time for a European election. But that's another story for another day. Well, joining us tonight, Vicky Ford, who's the Conservative MP for Chelmsford and used to be a European MP. For Labour, Beth Miller, who will be the Labour candidate in Corby at the next general election, whenever that comes. And we have the President of the Liberal Democrats, Baroness Sal Brinton. Thanks all for coming in. Um, first of all, Vicky Ford, lots of predictions about how badly the Conservatives might do in these local elections. What's your prediction? Across our region, Conservatives defending 1,300 seats. How many 
do you think you'll have well, after so obviously, next week? You know, this is a local election. I've been knocking on a lot of doors in my own constituency of Chelmsford, where we have our all-out elections. Um, they, they were last fought on a general election day um, back in 2015, and of course there'll be very high turnout on a general election. So you would so, expect. So does that to make be, it a high water mark? Yeah, where you yeah, can only so expect you would definitely to go expect down. lower turnout. But what I have but found. But you expect fewer so what councillors. I, so what I have found is that people really do want to talk. Very, there's an awful lot going on in politics. They want to talk. But they're also very focused on the fact this is a local election. The um, election in Chelmsford, the journey the council has been through the past 10 years, taking that area into being England's newest city, the number one place to live in the east of England. It's been a massive journey and I hope that voters will think about that when they're voting on Thursday to make sure that we can continue that positive journey. Beth Miller for Labour, this is a test of trying to make gains, isn't it? Because last time these seats were contested, you guys didn't do very well. Definitely. I think it's a real opportunity for Labour, especially in places like Northamptonshire where we've had you know, a huge crisis. The county council's gone bankrupt. We now haven't got elections here because of that. They've been delayed for a, a follow-up the, until next year. But that means that we have a really powerful message to be campaigning on, which is you've had 10 years of Tory austerity. They've cut your bus services, they've cut your libraries, they've cut your children's centres. £16, million, £16 billion pounds, sorry, will have been wiped off the budgets of of, uh, of councils, of local governments since 2010. And ultimately, I think this is, this is the message that we need to be getting out there that don't reward failure of Tory councils, basically. And Sal Brinton, for the Liberal Democrats as well, when we look at the last time these seats were contested in 2015, it, w it wasn't a very good night at all for the Liberal no, Democrats. I mean, I, think I mean, the only way surely is up, I guess, for you guys. absolutely is up. And if the Conservatives were on a high in 2015, the Liberal Democrats were definitely on a low point. And in the local elections, they, were, they also saw the problems that we faced in the general election that same night. And the atmosphere around the region, I've been travelling around uh, working with our councillors and council candidates right across the region, is very, very different. And I have to say that uh, we're getting a very good response in Chelmsford. Uh, we are also in North Norfolk. We've been building on the success we had in South Cambridgeshire last year in Cambridge City. And St Albans, as uh, has been identified, is, is pretty hopeful as well. Uh, and I just think it is a completely different atmosphere and people want to talk to us about what's going on in their area, which is really, really important. And our councillors have a good story to tell. How significant are these local election results, for example, for the Prime Minister, for the future, her future well, as leader? All election results are, true, uh, are significant, but I also think it's really important that we uh, tell uh, the truth to the public, because actually you know, this year the government has introduced the largest ever funding amount available to local councils, and the Labour Party and the Lib Dems didn't support it. It was a post of bigger than inflation rise. There's been £10 billion But, but that, that comes after an awful lot like of cuts, doesn't it, for which, local councils which, over the past e, nine which years? Also the Labour Party and the Lib Dem Party both said at that time at the peak of the crisis that that needed to happen. So I think it's important that we're truthful. On things like bus services in my area in Chelmsford next week, we've got new bus services being introduced actually. You know, we've got in Essex, we've got um, now outstanding for our children's services, you know, number one in the country. Exactly. So there's some really, really good work going on being run by Conservative led councils and actually Conservative-led councils also have some of the lowest council tax, the highest recycling rates of, of anywhere. So they're providing, you know, value so for money the and good services. Need to be very careful about saying that because certainly in some of the areas I've been, they've been saying they're the lowest taxpayer and they're omitting the county council tax well, in, level. In we need to be very, very clear. In North Ants County Council, we've actually the Secretary of State had to move our uh, amount up beyond the legal threshold. So now we're paying seven percent, as well as all the various add-ons. So I don't think it's actually quite right to say so Conservative councils are, the, are some of the lowest. So and also, in Chelmsford, you have just said all the positive things you have there. But we have had a county council in Northamptonshire run by the Conservatives since 2005, and look where they are now. So when we compare like for like, a Conservative on council is on average, and that's county and districts put together like for like, on average, £100 less a year than a Labour-run council and over £140 less per year per household than a Lib Dem-run council. And that's on average across the country. So that's the basis but on which I say value, value, value for money. But 
quickly from Salbrinton. But you also aren't taking into account deprivation and Conservative councils tend to have less areas of deprivation and in, there has an increasing support for those areas. Oh, well, we'll come rights. back to the elections later, but let's switch to another story that dominated headlines over the Easter break, the climate protest in the capital. It was the final day today of a fortnight of protests that brought some parts of central London to a standstill at various times. This morning the stock exchange was targeted by Extinction Rebellion, including two protesters from Norfolk. The groups calling for more action over global warming has been holding disruptive protests elsewhere too. In February they took over the Norfolk County Council Chamber and forced a four-hour delay to its annual budget setting meeting. And the protest in London brought out some famous faces with the actor Dame Emma Thompson joining in while the Olympic canoeist Etienne Stott, who's from Bedford, was arrested. Well, it's a big step to take. You know, I never would have thought that I would end up doing something like that. I would never have wanted to end up with this perhaps, you know, affecting me for the rest of my life. But I believe that this is my time to stand and be counted. Now people realise that there's one option left, which is to get involved. And non-violent civil disobedience is proven to work, you know, in the civil rights movement, Gandhi. Those things work to make big changes. And this is what the model that they're following. And joining our studio panel now is one of those protesters, University of East Anglia lecturer and Green Party activist Rupert Reid. Welcome to you, Rupert. Um, you've been on this protest, this rebellion. Is this the right thing to do, though, to disrupt the centre of London? I mean, shouldn't it be better to use democracy to, for example, tell people to go out and vote next week in the local elections on certain issues? Well, could I just start by saying that it was actually me who persuaded Etienne to put himself forward for potential arrest? Uh, the other day and I'm very proud of him, some, a hero from London 2012, one of 1,100 people who've put themselves on the line to bump the issue of climate and the ecological emergency more generally way up the political agenda. Such success we've had. William Hague coming it, out Is that saying, a success then getting lots of people, more than a thousand people arrested? Look, what we've done is we've totally transformed the public perception of this issue. An opinion poll out today says that over 60% of the British population now agree with our aims, and our aims are extremely radical. In terms of the local elections, of course, I'm still saying to everybody, vote green, and we're very hopeful of making gains in these elections, for example, in Suffolk, also in Peterborough. But it's clear that the democratic system, the representative governmental system as we have it, is not really moving fast enough. So I think it's totally legitimate to resort to civil disobedience as well, to try to concentrate minds, and that's what's happening. Vicky Ford, do you think the government has taken an awful lot of notice of this and changing things and so, doing more? So first of all, you know, climate change is a real, real threat and I completely agree that there needs to be urgent action. What, what I do think we need to remind people is actually the huge journey that we are on already and what's been happening in the UK where actually we've been cutting our emissions faster than any other developed country. We're the leader, we're the leader, we're leader in the world <laughs> in offshore wind, for example. There's much more that we need to do but we also need to work with the whole of the world the UK's are uh bidding to bring the world together here in London next year for the next global, global Congress on this. And I want to make sure that other people from around the world want to see a London that's welcoming them and not a London that has people super glued to the tube. So, yes, I agree with your message, but not the means. We've put. Beth Miller, should, is direct action the right way to get this issue right up there on the agenda, do you think, or not? From my perspective, I 100% wholeheartedly agree with the objectives of what the organisation is trying to do. Um, the three objectives they've got I think are totally reasonable and I think there has been a delay in making a lot of the progress that people want to see. Um, I haven't always agreed of all of the means so I think direct uh, action is useful. You know it's driven up the agenda massively. People are talking about it. Um, we were, you know, friends and I talk about it. I try to take, you know, reduce my plastic use and all the things I probably might not necessarily have done so much before. However, I think the next stage for the campaign now has to be about how do you how do you reach out beyond the people that already support you to the middle of the road voter and that's the big challenge how do you convert people who probably believe in it yeah. but actually get a bit frustrated by what you're doing at the moment exactly. do you think that's the case our Brenton that some people will look at these kind of protests and think we don't want to get arrested we don't want anything to do with something like that but people don't have to actually do that. Mm. The key thing is making everybody understand that whilst a lot of it needs to happen at government and at council level, 
every single one of us needs to change the way that we're doing things. And, you know, Vicky, there is no doubt that the government in this country over the last few years has moved us forward. But in 2015, for your government to get rid of the Green Investment Bank, to remove subsidies for solar uh, power, just demonstrated that the, your heart is not in it. And you mentioned really wind. You got rid of onshore wind and you claim yes. that your emissions are going down. But that's fake because you exclude air travel, <coughs> you exclude shipping and you exclude emissions in products from the figures. So, so, so actually so it's just not true. Excuse me, let me finish. Actually it's just not true that Britain is a leader on climate and that's why we are here. We're here to tell the truth. We're here to tell the truth that if we don't get our act together on this, we're facing an existential crisis. Right? But to meet some of these demands would require a really radical change That's right. of the way we live, wouldn't yeah, yeah, yeah. it? So it would require a very significant change in the way we live. It's not going to mean just, you know, electric cars and everything being nice and the same as I it mean, is. I mean, things like no air travel at all, that kind no, of thing. No, it's not no air travel at all. Don't put words in our mouths. It would be a significant reduction in air travel, yeah. Remember that the overwhelming majority of air travel is undertaken by the super rich. And if we carry on having more and more air travel, there's no future. Game over. Right? This is absolutely serious now and it's lovely to hear the other panellists here saying well that we agree with most of what you're saying in terms of what you want the objectives to be but it's only because these radical means have been taken that we're actually having this conversation at all. We can vote green in the election and we can actually get the right policies in which are actually seriously aligned with what we now need. So I do it is becoming a much bigger issue accused. at the agenda though isn't I, I it? I do object to being accused of telling untruths. Well, then don't On do a like-for-like -like <laughs> basis the UK has done more than any other developed False. country. When you there is more. And shipping and there is emissions. more that needs to be done Simply on false. aircraft, on shipping. Where actually the UK <coughs> is leading the world now to bring the world together on shipping because ships go from one country to another, mm -hmm. and leading that that challenge. And that absolutely needs to be, a continue to be and the work that we're doing. And I absolutely agree with what Salas said about bringing uh, members of the public together and actually I, I agree with what you've just said about reducing our plastic footprint as well. This year I got 48 Conservative MPs to take on an and, environmental and Vicky Ford, challenge. And just and yes or no, when yes, the government see this. this kind of protest, does it make a difference to so, how climate change is so dealt what, with? What we, we understand. Does it make a difference a to people like so Michael Gove? Does a, he see that and think, think we've got to does, do even more? What I think does make a real difference is when we hear young people, when we hear people in our community say, what are we doing? What more can we do together? I am concerned that we need to make sure that we continue having the global leadership on this. And that means making sure that London continues to be a place that people from across the world want to come together and talk and find solutions and policy. not just find the <laughs> Well, change your policies and it'll be all fine. We'll, we'll just leave it we'll there stop for this a moment. now if the policies get changed. <laughs> Well, we'll leave that there for now. But as we've heard, we not only face elections in a week's time, but there could also be another one in a month. Euro elections are looming if we don't leave the EU in the next four weeks. These two parties only represent themselves. They don't represent us. We have got to change politics for good. And let's start today here in Blackton. Already on the campaign trail this week in Essex, Nigel Farage with his new Brexit party. Change UK, the new independent party with Cambridgeshire MP Heidi Allen at the helm, launched with a full slate of candidates. And UKIP is still there too, not only with Euro candidates, but also fighting the local elections. Yes, you want somebody who's going to stick up for you in your, lo your locality. And the second reason is you're voting on a national level to send the message to Westminster. So if you vote UKIP in your local elections, you'll get a UKIP councillor, but you will also have sent a message by means of your vote to the Westminster class who have betrayed you over referendum. These elections are a chance to send the clearest possible message. We demand a people's vote and the right to remain and campaign to remain in the European Union. Beth Miller, we thought these elections would never happen had we left the European Union on the 29th of March. Are you pleased they are or now seem to be definitely happening? Well, obviously, because of the delay that's taken place, they now have to take place. I don't think any of us particularly wanted them to happen. We wanted, um, whether you remain or leave, you either wanted to get on with the job or you wanted a people's vote. And no, neither of those two camps have, have got what they wanted. Um, so I suppose uh, it's one of those things that, that people didn't necessarily want. Uh, but going forward, we need to prepare for them and Labour will bring out a manifesto and we have a full slate of candidates. Um, and, uh, you know, 
I know that a lot of those candidates will put their heart and soul into it for as long as they are an MEP for. Um, and and I it, think it's shaping up, if you like, to be a bit of a battle between Remain and Leave with the sort of Brexit parties and the non-Brexit parties. Is that tricky for Labour, as in, would you be a Brexit party or a Remain party? I don't think so. I think the European elections are about a lot more than just Remain or Leave, um, because ultimately... Labour aren't in power, it's the, it's the Tories that are in power at the moment and the decision on, uh, ultimately the decision on what will happen in uh, the autumn is up to Theresa May and whatever the parliamentary majority commands. Um, so from my perspective these are about what Labour can do for you uh, in your region um, and whether that's housing, uh, whether that's you know, lobbying but for better funding for schools. Will your manifesto say <laughs> remain or leave? Well, our, our, peop our, uh, our conference vote was that we would have some form of vote um, and, you know, that's, that's open to uh, interpretation, I suppose, and we'll see more when the manifesto comes out. You will indeed. Sal Brenton, the Liberal Democrats obviously want to see another referendum. If we see the results of these Euro elections and there's a very big vote for the Brexit parties, does that kill off a second referendum? Not necessarily, because it's not a referendum in itself. I think you're right that there will be a polarisation between the leave parties and the remain parties because both the conservative and the labor parties are still absolutely split which is why we can't move forward at the moment in parliament itself i mean we were the only party that took very seriously the threat of european elections and we have actually not just selected our candidates but our members have voted for their candidates in this region because we planned for it on the off chance that it would happen so did we uh, I'm pleased to hear that as well. But I think that's really important because actually we take the democracy of being in the European Union extremely seriously. And it was made clear three years ago by the European Union that 10, 29th of March this year was a deadline because otherwise we would need to be involved in the elections. And they've said that all along in all the negotiations. Rupert Reid, if this is a kind of proxy referendum between Remain and Leave, does that rule out a second referendum if, if Leave sort of when Do you see it as a proxy referendum? I don't think it is a proxy referendum, but I think what's clear is that if you are someone who wants to vote for Remain, then you need to vote either for Lib Dems or for Change or for the Greens. We've no idea what Labour are going to stand for I, in this election. I and if I could just say what the, what's additional in the Greens, it's that what we also offer, of course, is serious action on climate, serious action on ecology. And just, Vicky Ford, this, these elections the government don't want to have, are they definitely going to happen, do you think? So it's, of it's course way it, too is, late it, to it, you know, it. it is an enormously, enormously frustrating. I, I mean, we had a referendum in, in nearly three years ago. I voted Remain, but I totally respect that that referendum happened. People voted to leave. I voted uh, three times for the withdrawal We're running agreement. out of time. Will you which, be out campaigning it, for Conservative which, candidates? It, no, this is really important. If the Labour Party or the Lib Dems had supported the withdrawal agreement, we would not be having this election. Will they happen, We would not be having this election. Will they happen? We're going to have to leave it. So for technical reasons, I fear they she have to. Know. It's a, a <laughs> huge waste. Ice. Of effort, but and will. I would encourage We're people to, to leave vote. It there. Thanks very much for coming in. Goodbye. See you next month.